Oscar and Tony Award winner Mercedes Rule is back on the boards, playing Ma to Michael Urie's Arnold in Harvey Firestein's Torch Song. Hear the stage and screen icon on her early days of struggle in New York City, how she hit the showbiz jackpot in one year, and why the bond between mothers and sons touches her heart on this week's Show People. Mercedes, I'm so happy you are here. It's a pleasure to be here. Big, big fan of yours. No, so if I fan you. out a little bit, just excuse <laughs> me. Just please, please pardon it. I know it can be annoying. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> this is an amazing return, Torch Song. It's a huge hit off Broadway, second stage. You know, I, when I first heard this was coming back and that Harvey Firestein was working on maybe, you know, re examining his, his big hit from. 1983, I guess. Mm -hmm. When did you first hear this was happening, and how did this sort of enter into your life? I heard it in the spring. So it, it was already a, um, an established uh, uh -huh. project with yep. Second Stage, and I think Second Stage had wanted to do a revival of it for a long time. And um, Harvey just kept saying no, and because he couldn't find anybody to play him, basically, mm. right. until old Michael Urey Michael came Urey. waltzing down the pike. I mean, his anyway, career is amazing right now, what he's doing. I mean, yeah. he's just been gone from one great project to the next. And yeah, yeah. He was great in The Government Inspector. Grabbed a donut somewhere and came to the, <laughs> the rehearsal hall for uh, Torch Song. And now uh, he's, he's going to grab a sandwich and go down and play Hamlet at the <laughs> Shakespeare Festival in D.C. Yeah. And, but I mean, from Torch Song to Hamlet and, and the farce before that, this guy is, is he's going through three different styles, three absolutely yeah different kinds of mm -hmm. characters in a period of about five months. And I can tell you, he's the calmest, steadiest, dearest man. You know, with all of the, all of the things that are happening in the world and in New mm -hmm. York and yeah. in politics and government, you can get a little bit anxious and a little anxious about the human race and where it's going. And, 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 and there seems to be a sinister element abroad sometimes in the right. world. I walk to the theater and I see Michael Urie's face. He's like this huge, like six, eight foot poster yeah. on the building. And I say, but there, Michael Urie's in the world. Wow. And, and so I have hope. I have hope. Just his face calms me down on that poster. That's what a great guy How he is. How sweet is that? Yeah, yeah, and, and a talent to match. And so you're playing his mother. Now, now Mrs. Beckoff, now she's just called Ma. I think her, I think she's just. I prefer you Mrs. As Beckoff. Ma. I like Mrs. Madame. Oh, Mrs. Beckoff, you know, Ma. Nobody, whatever. A, nobody asks. Ma. <laughs> <laughs> Estelle Getty played this part yeah. originally on Broadway. Yeah, I don't I think of you as an Estelle Getty type. No. But yeah. you, you are bringing. Mercedes rule to this. I love it. You're, so you're the mom. You you come in late in the play. So it's, it's sort of three parts to the show. Three parts to the show, and I come in a few minutes into the third part. So what are you doing before that? Just oh, just getting nervous. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I'm I'm getting a little bit more relaxed, yeah. you know. But w you have to be there at, at curtain time, or else y the the stage manager gets apoplectic. The, but the curtain goes <laughs> up, and one of the, one of the actors isn't in the theater yet. Yeah, you can't so you show up at nine o'clock. No, they don't let you do that. <laughs> Also, I, I then um, go through the, this, my scenes. I have these little uh, five or six uh, uh, copies of just my scenes, mm -hmm. and they're well-worn, and they've got coffee stains on them <laughs> and everything. And I, I, I just go through them still. It, it's early days still in, in the yeah. performances every night and look for something I might not have seen before. You know, um, yeah. I described it to somebody the other day. as you, You're looking for an arrowhead in the furrow, something you hadn't seen before that could enliven mm -hmm. a moment, change a moment. Um, not redirected from the author's intentions, but redirect, you know, uh, uh, how the scene goes and give it a new life. Yep. Give it, a, you know, just, just quicken it. Mm -hmm. Just give it that zets of mm -hmm. something new. So that's fun. Mm -hmm. so then I do that for a while. If I still have time left over, I, I get in trouble on my cell phone going <laughs> to uh, the Nordstrom Rack or, you know, various <laughs> other like, places looking for cashmere sweaters. <laughs> So you might Deals be shopping during the second <laughs> scene. May, that might be happening. <laughs> but at, at this point, no, I'm still kind of focused yeah. on uh, finding some new stuff. Because I like to come out and surprise Michael with a slightly different take on things. Yeah. He's come to expect it. <laughs> so Mrs. Beckoff uh, shows up from Florida. Yeah. And, and she's in Arnold's uh, apartment and dealing with a maybe boyfriend. She's sort of 
processing a lot. She, a lot gets thrown at her. Well, she knows there's a there's a roommate, right? And the right. roommate's name is David. So there's right. another man in the apartment when she arrives. And she says, you know, David, I presume. And he says, no, I'm mad. And she's like, oh, boy, here we are. Off to the <laughs> races already. And you, you sense in the woman an inner conflict, um, which is the love that she has. I mean, it's very clear that yeah. this is her favorite kid, mm -hmm. you know. And this uh, um, uh, predisposition against homosexuality that was not uncommon uh, in the 60s and 70s, right. obviously. And, right. and, um, and so I, I think uh, she feels it's, uh, uh, it's morally incorrect, it's, it's, it's physically incorrect, it's, it's socially incorrect, and it's not going to lead him you know, on a path to happiness mm -hmm. and fulfillment. She, she obviously, it's a form of ignorance. but. But um, for her, this, this, this uh, uh, need to persuade her son to reconsider his homosexuality is a, is a way of saying, please do this for yourself. Please, please, don't go into this life that's going to be lonely and difficult and this and that mm -hmm. and the other. So it's all an act of love, but at the same time, it's an act of intolerance, and it's a hard, it's a hard little um, line to walk. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm sure this deals with a lot of things that are near and dear to you. Uh, m motherhood, you are a mother. Yeah. Uh, even the topic of adoption, you know, is, is yeah. really sort of a relevant part yeah. of this. Yeah. And this, yeah. this like taps into you, into, into your life and, yeah. and your, your yeah. background. Yeah. Yeah. So is, that, is all that um, make it uh, really special for you? Yeah. I mean, my younger son is, is adopted, yeah. and um, he came to the opening night, and Michael Urey said, D did you recognize anything? And he said, yes, yeah, she talks to me the same way. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I do not. He's 20 now, right? He's 20, uh -huh. yeah. Um, but uh, I, I have to say, the love of sons is, um, and the love of mothers and sons is a very, it's a very special kind of love, you know? It, it has a kind of poignancy that no other love has. And it's, I don't want to say it's less or more than, mm -hmm. but it, it's its own kind of poignancy. And um, so it, it's very familiar. This. And actually, I, my own son is, is a lovely, lovely person mm -hmm. too, just, to, just by who he is. And he's got a lovely soul like Michael Urey, just has a lovely soul. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're very similar in certain ways. And uh, around the third performance, the director said, we have to give Michael a, a, a special bow. So we all get together in a line, we hold hands and we bow, and everybody bows individually, and he bows individually, and we bow again. And then he said, okay, everybody p pull back now and just give Michael the last bow. And the, the, um, the first time we did it on stage in front of an audience, I'm going, okay, I'm going to do it. And we all pulled back, and I watched Michael bow, and tears <laughs> start mm. to come. I, it was, I mean, it was it was Michael, but it was my son, but it was my mm. son, but it was Michael, uh -huh. and I just, I just, I, I couldn't believe I was crying wow. <laughs> for him, but tears of joy, you know. So yeah, I, I, I do feel, I, I do feel that tug of motherhood of yeah. sons in the show every night. You were in New York, obviously, when this it was a hit the first time. It ran almost three years on Broadway. Did you see it? Did For you some, some reason, I was either out working or I was in the boonies doing some kind of, you know, because yeah. I, uh, I worked regional theaters a lot at that point in time. I didn't see it. This one passed me by. Wow. So I didn't see the play. I didn't see Estelle Getty. And then I didn't see the movie. So I right. didn't see Anne Bancroft right. either. Right. And then I, was, I thought, well, now you can't go no, because yeah. now you'll be, I'll be persuaded unconsciously mm -hmm. to, to, to copy uh, perhaps uh, inflections and stuff, so right. I can't do it. Right. Um, after, after I'll, well, I'll you can tell, but You can tell you haven't seen it because what you're doing is really special and unique and very you, and, and it's what makes it so successful. I love it. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad you think so. I, 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 was, I was aware um, just from the reactions of other people in the room, including the um, director and the writer, that uh, what I had come up with was a little different from yeah. what they, they were expecting. It's also important that that's an actress up there that the audience loves, and I feel like you are one of those actresses where you walk on stage, and you just, I felt the energy in the room the minute you sort of walked on stage, and you know, you really want to sort of grapple with this woman, and she's saying things you don't like, but, but you really feel for her, and every time that you go behind that door and close yourself in the bedroom, it's just <laughs> like, it's heartbreaking, so 
So I think the production is very lucky to have you, and I'm, I'm thrilled you're doing it. Oh, thank you. And thank after you. all that ass kissing, we're going to take a quick break. Okay. And we'll be right back <laughs> with more Mercedes <laughs> Rule. We are back with Mercedes Rule, who I'm so excited is here. So can we go back, and I want to talk about your childhood a little bit, because you actually had sort of a really interesting childhood. I'm sure people are always fascinated by the fact that your dad was an FBI agent. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. sort of like something you don't hear every day. Yeah, no. Um, so what did that it, mean? it also meant we moved around a yeah, lot. Yeah, it's a lot of moving so, around. Um, my, my dad was, uh, he went into the FBI when he graduated um, college from mm -hmm. Fordham. And at that time, in the early 50s, the FBI was recruiting a lot from the big Jesuit universities. My father had gone on the okay. GI Bill after the war. Uh, because they were getting a kind of agent from these big Jesuit educated universities, it was just what Hoover was looking for, uh -huh. um, for a number of reasons, you know. Um, but certainly, you know, the, there's the intelligence and the, and the high moral mm -hmm. fiber, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, uh, Hoover purported to insist right, on. Right. And, uh, but my dad, my dad was very happy to be um, uh, in the FBI. Uh, he loved doing investigations. He loved the kind of work that he was doing. And, but it meant, as children, we moved around a lot. We mm. did, I was born in New York, but by the time I was two, we were living in Indiap Indianapolis. And then we went to Scranton, Pennsylvania, then back to New York for a couple of years, then down to the seat of government in Washington, D.C., where my dad stayed for about 13, 14 years at the behest of my mother um, on the uh, domestic Chinese intelligence desk. So that my brother and I could grow up sort of right. from fourth grade to at right. least en okay. entering college in mm -hmm. one place. And so it was, it, but, but it was interesting. It yeah. was um, every two, two, three years we would move and usually it was for some reason always in December. So <laughs> you'd have to wind up in some new little parochial school somewhere. Um, with the wrong uniform on and, <laughs> and the uncool shoes and, and until you got, you know, adjusted into this new school. Right. What about Mickey? Yeah. Your, mo your mom's also named Mercedes by her. Mickey. Mickey. Was Mickey her, was, was her, her name was Mercedes, but they called her Mickey. And at a certain point, uh, especially moving around, Mercedes was a, uh, a name that not a lot of kids could uh, as, as say easily. And I remember by the time I was in Pennsylvania, I was known as Myrtle Sneeze, Turtle Sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided at that point I was going to co-op my mother's nickname. So for about eight years, I was also known as Mickey. Okay, Mickey, yeah. And my, my old friends down in Maryland, who is, I'm still very close to some of my high school friends, they still call me Mick and Mickey. And oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Mickey Merce. <laughs> oh, nice. I like that. So you, I, I read something about that you lived in Pennsylvania at some point, right? Yeah, that's right. And there was a, a building in the back, and what was the building on the hill? It was like a theater. We'll talk about this. Oh, oh. All it was is a long white brick building. So it looked almost like the back of a theater of a, of a stage, you know? So I would go out there and I would sing by myself and I would do little operas. <laughs> and um, I, I think at that time I was probably four or five, and we were going to these little Catholic schools, so I think basically my theme was Baby Jesus <laughs> <laughs> all the time, my little songs. And I didn't know, but a lot of the ladies followed my career <laughs> from behind their kitchen curtains. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then I moved into, I, I got my, my good friends, uh, Judy and Lenny and Eleanor, and uh, we, did so we did plays in our parents' living rooms. And I remember doing one, a Christmas-themed play, uh, where I said, we're going to have snow on the ground <laughs> in the living room. And everybody went, oh, wonderful. So we went out and got angel hair. Now, I don't know if you know angel hair, but it's long filaments of, of like, it's hard. It's, it's like made uh -huh. of some kind of uh, 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 metal that's just been you right. Know. Yeah. And so um, I wasn't allowed in anybody's house for about six months because the, the angel hair got stuck in the rugs, and people <laughs> were getting it up. That and even by, by summertime, they were they were still walking on ow angel hair. So yeah, that was the beginning of my life in art. <laughs> but you had a need to perform. Where do you think that came yeah, from? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I just wanted a lot of attention. I think it was a <laughs> narcissistic, you know. I think I wanted a lot of attention. Yeah. And I, I wanted to be the, the, the center of attention. And uh, 
Um, I mean, at one point, I, 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 I told all the kids in the neighborhood that I knew an Indian princess who brought me candy. She was magical, and she looked just like me. <laughs> and um, they said they, they insisted on seeing her. So I had a Dale Evans, little girl, Dale Evans, you know, cowgirl. Wow. And I put it on inside out, and I put a feather in my hair, and I went, <laughs> I didn't I, I went, I went back, and there were about 17 kids in the backyard, and they, they, they said, where's the candy? And I, I thought I had a couple of bars somewhere, but I said, it'll come, it's coming, it's coming. And <laughs> it's my brother coming. came up to me, and he said, I, I know you're Merce, but just admit to me that you're Merce. He was seven, I was six, I think. Um, and I wouldn't tell anybody. And I just looked at him, and the famous line was, me, no, no, you white boy, I said. And... Um, I convinced him, absolutely convinced him, that it was not his sister. So then, <laughs> at that point, narcissism started to look like a money-making proposition. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was six, but I saw the light. You've done you know, well I, with it. I think, I think, I think. Eventually, as I grew up, I still loved theater. I still yeah. loved acting. I can't account for it, but it was there from the very beginning. And then eventually, I became, as I got older, fascinated with the. The psychological aspect of it, the mm. art of it, the mm. the um, the revealing uh, 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 delight mm -hmm. that I take in acting, uh, uh, it it morphed into something else, something deeper. So I know that you always wanted to move to New York. That was always sort yeah. of like that was yeah. like you knew, you knew that was yeah. going to happen, yeah. and it happened what when you were twenty one. Twenty one. Five hundred dollars in starter money. Oh God, you've done your homework. Five hundred dollars in starter money, My right? My grandpa gave grandpa me five hundred dollars which lasted years <laughs> <laughs> in New York City. <laughs> oh, man. All the temp jobs, all the waitresses. But that was, that was tough, n you know, 1970s New York City. I know. It was, it, it, it was a tougher city then. It was, it was tough to get work. It was tough to get an apartment. Everything was tough. Um, and, and, and I remember, you know, I, I always thought of, you know, Manhattan as being, you know, that night in Manhattan yeah. was the start <laughs> of it. You know, very romantic and... Yeah. and but I was living on the Upper West Side, kind of with, with friends who were actually doing graduate work at Columbia, so in Morningside uh -huh. Heights, and it was kind of a poorer neighborhood around Columbia, right. and rough, and tough, and street fights, and stuff like that, you know? And um, it was a high crime area. And there were times when I thought, I, I felt like I'd, at 21, I had grown up and grown old before I ever, you know, really enjoyed being young. And Man, you um, toughen up quick. Yeah, you did. Uh -huh. yeah, I had to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that that eventually gave way to really beginning to enjoy the city. Um, but there, but there were a lot of struggling years. But oh do you, yeah. do you look back on those years romantically now, or do you remember the tough times, or what do you, what do you think that all did to you? I I remember that it was tough. I remember that I had no money. Um, I remember um, actor friends at the time. I mean, by the time I was about 23, I was in a wonderful workshop. Reed Bernie came to the show uh, the mm -hmm. other night, and we were remembering being in this workshop. He was, wow. he was a few years younger than I, so he was like 21, I was like 24. And um, we did a lot of Noel Coward, and uh -huh. Sigourney Weaver was in the workshop, wow. uh, Jim McClure, the playwright, Sam Art Williams. There were some really wonderful people in this workshop. None of us had any money. Right. Um, but we, we had a... We had a family among ourselves, mm -hmm. and we kept ourselves strong, and we mm -hmm. kept ourselves full of um, dreams and hopes. Mm -hmm. and a lot of waiting. Without table. them, I don't know if I, you know, would have made it. But a lot know, of waiting tables. A lot um, of waiting tables. And a lot of. But with a lot of compadres who were waiting tables too, and yeah. and tending bar and doing jobs like that, so that they can they could do off off Broadway at night. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, w once you hit like your late thirties, is when it seems like, on paper at least, it seems like wow, everything sort of started clicking. Well, it started clicking actually a little bit earlier. It started cl clicking around 30. Okay. Um, I started really doing, in my, my late 20s, early 30s, a lot of regional theater. Okay. And there came, uh, I think I was 30 or 31, I uh, ha had six auditions for Saturday Night Live, and I also had an audition for Medea at the Denver Center Theater of the Arts, which was the yeah. Lincoln Center of the West uh -huh. at that point. And so it was like, what a choice, you know, yeah, what Medea, a you know, <laughs> Euripides, or Saturday Night Live. <laughs> well, finally, Saturday Night Live went in the other direction, so I, I, um, I did Medea, and, uh, and it was an extraordinary experience, and right. so I, that, that opened up several years of doing uh, regional theater mm -hmm. where I learned a lot. I learned right. a lot about acting. Right. And by my mid-30s, I was working at the 
um, public theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to talk about that. Because when you won your Oscar for The Fisher King, one of my favorite movies, uh, you actually mentioned Joe Papp. And, and you in your speech, and you yeah. told this story about. What, can you talk about that? It was a play called um, "Coming of Age in Soho" right. by a, um, a Albert Inarato, and it was my the first show that I did at, at the public, and I was very nervous. And uh, Pap was in on a lot of the rehearsals, and I would stand behind a chair in my scene, and he kept saying, "Come around in front of the chair." come around in front of the chair and get in the light. The light is in front of the <laughs> chair. And so I pull myself around and be in the light, you know, and it's a very scary in the light. It was <laughs> safer back in the shadows. But um, I, did, I did quote that story and, and I said he, he, was, he was a guy who forced me into the light. He was, he was a, a, a big influence and there was a great, the great man who ran the workshop that I, I told you about uh, with uh, Reed and Sigourney. Mm-hmm. His name was Tad Danielewski. Mm-hmm. He was a, a, a Polish director uh, um, who had, you know, been in, in the camps during the war and yeah. was, uh, he, he was part of the Polish underground. He was a genius. He was brilliant. and. Um, to this day, I, I know Reed and Sigourney would say he taught us most of what we know. Yeah. So those two men were, were big influences on me. It's nice. You don't always get to hear Joe Papp mentioned at the Oscars. So it's, you know, it's nice when you, when you see those moments. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back with more Mercedes Rule. back with Mercedes Rule. Now, I, you, I just mentioned you won an Oscar, yeah. and you actually won a Tony for uh, Neil Simon's Lost, yeah, in Yonkers, Lost in Yonkers, and that yeah. happened all within a year. Yeah, which it's is weird. It wasn't, it wasn't the same right calendar the year, but yeah. it happened within a 12-month period. Right. I don't know. I, I felt like I was somehow in some somebody else's life, you know? <laughs> it really felt surreal. Well, I'm sure, especially when you've been, you know, struggling or working on your craft as an actor for so many years. And, yeah. And maybe feeling like, is this going to happen for me or not? And then suddenly it all happens. Oh, yeah. No, I, I was ab- about uh, two or three years before this. Um, I, I had gone to visit my folks for Christmas and nothing was happening, really. This was before the Albert and Arado mm-hmm. and Joe Papp. Right. Right before it. Yeah. Days before it, Wow, in fact. okay. And Before you um, stepped out of the shadow. I, I, I said to my parents, I, I don't want to live like a graduate student for the rest of my life, you know, and with, you know, graduate student furniture. And, a, and if this is not going to happen for me, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else. I, I'm going to be a director. I'm going to be hmm. this. I'm going to be a writer. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let this, this, you know, yeah. uh, this, this failure to break through into acting define me. And... Um, it was almost like, you know, the powers that be said, oh, okay, she's going to go if we don't, th- <laughs> we don't throw her a fish now. So <laughs> within a day or two, I mean, it wow. was really Christmas week, I got this call and they were re-casting re, um, uh, uh, this play mm-hmm. at the public. Mm-hmm. I had two and a half weeks to go in and rehearse it. They needed somebody right away. Albert had seen my work. He liked me. He said, no audition, nothing. Just say yes, you'll okay. do it. And it was like this door that I've been banging on like this, mm-hmm. you know, for, for 12 years, 10 years, 12 yeah. years, suddenly just opened like that and said, come oh, please, in. come on in. <laughs> and yeah, and then um, one thing happened yeah, after just, another. Very like then I did another roll. show uh, at the public, then another show at the public, yeah. then I did I'm Not Rap Report on Broadway, then yeah, I got because big, then because I got... somebody else, it, the woman, the actress who was in it, right, she broke her leg? She or? broke her leg. Oh, she yeah. was off Broadway and it was moving to yeah, Broadway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was, she wasn't healed by the time it had to go yeah. on Broadway. And she, she, was, she was a real good egg about it, too. But uh, yeah, but then when it started to happen, it had the inevitability of... of uh, Cards just yeah. falling, you know, and and it it, it was as easy to if for me at that time to mm-hmm. have wandered into this golden period as it had been very easy to be in poverty and, and right, desperation, right. you know, yeah. three years before. So it was it was very odd. It was a little surreal. But because you were coming from that, does it keep you sort of in check, or is it easy easy to get wrapped up in? I the I, I, I think it can go either way. Yeah. How did how did it work for you? Um, well, I, I I think it it took a while for my maturity to catch up with mm. what was what was happening. You know, um, when when suddenly you're in the limelight, 
um, a certain kind of entitlement or arrogance can sweep in mm. and and dance you off for a merry dance or two and you can make <laughs> a few mistakes. But success, success is hard. Success um, has a way of, 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 of distorting people, distorting your expectations, distorting your personality, distorting your sense of your own value and worth. And it takes a, a very, very strong character to to, n to not let that happen right. or noticing that it's happening to pull oneself back. Which brings me back to Michael Urey, who is a person of, of such modesty and kindness and uh, willing to work collegially with people. This, this, this trap, he's not gonna fall into. I guarantee you, he will not fall into the arrogance trap mm -hmm. or the entitlement trap. And uh, so he's a breath of fresh air, and it's, yeah. it's so delightful. Where's your head now about your career? I mean, it feels like you're doing things that uh, intrigue you, that you want to do. Uh, do you still feel like you have uh, a fire and a drive? And, or is it, I'm just wondering, like, you know, when, you, when you've been doing it for as long as you've been doing it and ha you've had the success, what gets you excited about something? What made you want to do Torch Song? Or do you still? Well, it's funny. You, you know, all this happened. Yeah. And then? I was in a relationship, and then I adopted my son, yeah. and then my mom passed, and my father came to live with me, and Real I moved out to yeah. East Hampton Springs, and I actually became a mom. I became the fulcrum of a household for a while, and um, I had this wonderful, well, Tad Danielewski, the great acting teacher that I referred to earlier, he said it's very hard for women um, who are actresses to have families and children, because he said, the greatest creative act in the world is to have and nurture a child, mm. and it will take it will take all the in, it will it will take the intensity out of your career mm -hmm. because you know right, uh, th this yeah. kind of creative energy can't be spread right. so thin. So and that's exactly what happened. Mm. Um, I became much more interested in the, my 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 sons. Yeah and um, my, my family. And uh, so this is really, I, and I did a couple of plays. I did The Goat uh, yep. for a uh, couple of fantastic. pieces by Edward right. Albee, uh, Occupant about Louise yes. Nevelson. Yeah. I did The American Plan, uh, Richard Greenberg's play. But that, that was, I would come in, you know, sublet yeah. an apartment and go you back drop out. drop in, be brilliant, and yeah. disappear for a couple more But in, in the last 18 months, I've committed to an apartment, which is, you know, okay. a commitment. Back in New York. And um, eight, eight shows a week. Of uh, of a piece that's it's rather uh, demanding. Even even yeah. though it's just that Absolutely. second act, it's yeah. it's whoa, and I'm finding that I love it. And uh, but I would also love to now get into um, cre creating a piece, uh, creating for instance uh, um, a mini series or a series. And I have a couple of ideas. I'm oh. working with somebody, and also directing. But the acting thing, I have to say, it's still there. As soon as I get out there, there is this feeling of, oh, what am I going to do tonight? Oh, uh, how, fantastic! Uh, how 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 am I going to um, uh, shake things up in a in a good yeah. sense for everybody else on stage so that we're all on our toes? Mm -hmm. You know, so that 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 is still as much there as it was 30 years ago. I love it. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited that that you're back and that you want to do all these things. I can't Thank wait you. to see. Thank you. See what else you, you bring us. Well, we'll see. <laughs> see what's coming down the pike. <laughs> but right now, Mrs. Beckoff uh, <laughs> is in Torch Song through mm -hmm. December 9th. It's the final extension. It's a huge hit off Broadway, and everyone needs to check it out. It's a fantastic, fantastic piece, and you're, you're just uh, beautiful in it. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it really was a treat to have pleasure. you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.